Good morning, Pursue. Welcome. You can go ahead and greet one another. Come on. 
is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar the fathers and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrow and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ oh come to the altar the Father's
bear your cross as you wait for your crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Jesus is calling. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Pursuit. It's a beautiful day. It's a great day to be together just to uh, worship God. I'm usually overwhelmed uh, just by how wonderful it is to be here, to see your bright, shiny faces, and, uh, and just for us to be here together. So Pursuit is a church. We are, we are committed to uh, pursuing, belonging, believing, and becoming. And the sermon today is going to be particularly about that area of belonging, of, of God's care for his church and his people within the church. And so I look forward to, uh, to sharing what God put on my heart uh, for this week. <clears throat> well, um, being part of a church family means that we get to, uh, to celebrate uh, with people, especially when special occasions uh, come up. And uh, so I'd like to ask Isaac to tell what special occasion is coming up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there she is. <laughs> she likes to be in the center stage, too. So, <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, it's, uh, it's great to be part of a church family, and uh, it's wonderful to see when, when God brings uh, people together in, in engagement and marriage, and so um, that's great. Well, um, I'd like to give a little sort of preamble here um, to the sermon today, and I just I want to talk about something. Um, it's, it's generally true about the book of Matthew, so we're going through this book of Matthew, and um, we believe in what's called expository preaching. So I try to expose what's in the Bible, most of all, when I preach. And it means also that we're committed to going through whole books of the Bible. And um, so we're in Matthew 18 now. I believe we've talked about every single verse um, within the book of Matthew up to now, or at least read it. And... Um, so we, we believe in preaching through books in their entirety. And so we preach from the Old Testament. We preach from the New Testament. And one of the things that does uh, is cause us to preach what's in the Bible and not just what comes to our mind as, you know, perhaps what we think is a good, a good topic for people to hear. We, we want to make sure that the Bible is what's put in front of people each week. Uh, there's... Um, a lot of churches that aren't that aren't committed to that, um, as we are. I'm not trying to make a comparison, but um, well, maybe I am. But um, so we are we are committed to expository preaching. Now, it also means that we're going to preach because it comes up in the Bible. We're going to have to preach hard topics, difficult topics, and and so uh, like John did last week, he preached about divorce. Um, it's a very difficult topic, and I'm glad that sometimes I can get a buy um, in preaching and ask John to do that for me because he has more experience with the subject and more ministry experience in dealing with people that are in the midst of it or um, have been divorced. So the Bible does talk about difficult subjects, and sometimes also in the book of Matthew, we're going to notice that Jesus uses words that are very, very sharp to our ears um, sometimes. And uh, like I said a few weeks ago, um, repeating what I heard from somewhere else, I don't know where, but if Jesus, is, uh, Jesus never speaks more sharply than the hardness of his hearers requires. And so sometimes Jesus will, will say things that are very sharp, but you got to remember he's trying to penetrate hard hearts. And so um, if Jesus was speaking to a religious leader, who thinks they have it all figured out, um, but is not believing in their own Messiah, uh, namely Jesus, the Son of God, then he speaks harshly to them at times uh, to break through that hard heart. So um, we also need to think about sometimes who Jesus is talking to. 
And so if he says it would be better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck and them cast into the sea, um, he's talking about people that cause believers to sin. And his reaction is very, God's judgment is very severe. And, uh, and they should be severe. God's, the proclamation of God's judgment should be severe because there's nothing worse than coming face to face with God without Jesus as your Savior. Um, he, he bore our sins on the cross. So sin will be punished either by the sinner in hell forever or by Jesus. And so, so in this case, severe is good. Those warnings are severe and they are good. So today we're going to talk about um, something else that sounds harsh to our ears, and it's excommunication. And so we're going to talk about that topic. Um, but what I want us to do, remind us, is listen to the heart of Jesus. It is his heart that cares for his people and protects them. So at this time, um, please join me in prayer. Father, we, uh, we say thank you again for your goodness to us in revealing Jesus to us, showing us our need to have a Savior, drawing us in faith to put our belief in Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful. Jesus, what you've done for us to die for our sins and to protect us from the righteous wrath of God. And Lord, we know that, Father, it's your will that that happens too. You want people to be saved. You sent Jesus into the world for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So, Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we, uh, we pray for a few that are in the church uh, this morning that, that need a physical touch from you and healing. So we pray for Judy Schindler that had a fall this week and is banged up. And, um, Lord, we just pray for your, your touch and your healing for her. Father, we pray for, for Brian Rosenbaum, who uh, had COVID last week and is still, still lingering on him. And so, Father, we, we pray, Lord, that you would, uh, would, you, would just touch him. But, Father, we, we thank you for this morning. We, we commit it to, to you um, this service, we want to worship you. Lord, be with us as we, we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, I'd like to invite the deacons to come and receive your tithes and offerings.
to be my blessed Savior, I surrender all. You may be seated. The children may be dismissed to their class. We wish it was easy to uh, change ourselves um, and to be anything that we wanted to be. Now, I suppose that's some of the appeal of superhero movies, um, where people are suddenly transformed into a being with superpowers, um, often by no effort of their own. Um, they encounter some sort of supernatural force or some sort of radiation or a bite even from an irradiated spider and turn into Spider-Man. Um, so that, that idea also extends into the world of comic strips, um, where Calvin, in the comic strip, Calvin and Hobbes, it's written by Bill Watterson, was no different. So Calvin is a little kid with a wild imagination, if you haven't seen this strip before, and he has a friend named Hobbes, who is a stuffed tiger that uh, comes to life in his imagination. So Calvin is uh, standing um, next to a large upside-down cardboard box, and Hobbes is there. And so Calvin says, this transmogrifier will turn you into anything at all. And uh, Calvin also says, all you do is set the indicator, and the machine automatically restructures your chemical configuration. You can be an eel or a baboon, a giant slug or a dinosaur. And Hobbes says, well, what if you want to be something else? He says, Calvin says, well, I just left some room. Just write it on the side of the box. So it would be nice if we had a character transmogrifier. So if we could just step into the chamber and be transformed into a mature, holy believer that's full of faith, um, but we can't. And so though God has made us he has transmogrified us in a way. He has made us alive in Christ. He has recreated us. We were born again um, so that we are literally a new creation. And so, but he desires us to grow. Um, so every parent loves their little baby, um, but they want it to grow too. So it would be a tragedy if a child was born and didn't grow and mature and learn to walk and talk. So God doesn't leave us either as newborns. Um, as wonderful as they are, um, he wishes and he wills for us to grow, and it will be difficult. Um, so a few weeks ago, we started into the, the chapter Matthew 18, and the disciples had asked Jesus what turned out to be an embarrassing question. They ask him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And uh, so we know from another passage in the Bible that they were expecting one of these 12 to be part of the answer. Um, we know that because it says in the book of Luke, it says an argument arose among them as to which one of them was the greatest. And so, um, so we see they wanted, they wanted to be something other than they were. Um, and they wanted a quick way to get there. And so they thought that simply because they were part of the chosen group, um, that, the, that as disciples, that their greatness was already assumed. And so Jesus, in the remainder of this chapter, chapter 18, that we're going to be talking about today, in a series of parables explains to them how to be transformed in their hearts into those who are truly great in the kingdom of heaven. So a few weeks ago, we saw what Jesus did. We started 18, chapter 18, verse 2. It says, In calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So they'd asked the question, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus really set them back. Um, he was saying that, you need to be thinking first if you will be there at all. Um, 
you must humble yourself like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you must be willing to accept that you are not great and you can do nothing and everything that you need can only be received by God's grace. So next he told them some other solemn words to reorient their minds. He said, whoever receives such a child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So his words are strange and they're startling, um, but showed how important to God each child is that puts their faith in him. So their faith and life in Christ are so important that it elicits a strong reaction from God for anyone that messes with the children of God. So if we want to be great, we need to see God's children as he does, whose faith is very precious and needs to be protected. Now, we are just like the disciples um, at times. We want to be different. Um, we want a quick transformation. And we are also naturally self-seeking. So if we want to be great in the kingdom, then we need to listen carefully to Jesus' words. So let's read uh, part of our passage for this week. That's Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 and following. Verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices it over, over it more than the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So in this story, we see again how valuable God sees his children. Um, Jesus said that his earthly children, these little ones, are so important to God that their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So now this is not teaching that every person has a, um, has a guardian angel. It's not teaching that. We can't go that far. Um, the writer of the book of Hebrews does say this about angels, though. In, in Hebrews 1.14, he says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So the angels do minister to us as us believers. I don't know if it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, though. You know, they don't probably have a name tag, you know, Dave's angel. But um, they are ministry to us believers. That's, the Bible says that. So, so God's children are so important to, to him that God sends his angels out from his very presence to come and minister to believers. So, if we want to be great in the kingdom, we need to understand how valuable God's children are to him. This is the point of all these stories for the disciples that Jesus is speaking. If we want to be great in the kingdom, we need to understand how valuable God's children are to him. So then Jesus continued by saying in verse 12, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go search for the one that went astray? So Jesus used this story other times. If You'll find almost the same story in the book of Luke. Um, he says something similar, but in that case, the, uh, the shepherd is seeking the lost sheep in order to bring them to salvation. <clears throat> but in this story, Jesus is saying that God also searches for us that have already believed when we start straying from him. So God searches to save us, and he searches to keep us saved. God is re relentless in seeking us out to keep us from harm. So God sends his angels to help us, and he searches himself 
when we stray from him. So again, if we want to be great, I'm waiting for the slide. If we want to be great in the kingdom, we need to understand how valuable God's children are to him. So another way to see this is that Jesus is telling the disciples to learn to be like shepherds of God, just like God is. So they will seek and save the lost just like he does. So as we looked a few weeks ago in Ezekiel chapter 34, in this passage, Ezekiel is saying to the leaders of Israel that they are bad shepherds. Okay, so in Ezekiel 34, he says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should, you, should the shepherds not feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness so you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep are scattered. And a little bit further, verse 11 in that passage, God says this through through Ezekiel. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when he is among his sheep that they have been scattered, so will I seek my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places for they have been scattered on the day of clouds and thick darkness. So God is the shepherd that seeks us out too when we stray. He seeks us out to bring salvation to us, and he continues to seek us out to when we're even when we're strayed as believers. So each of us, each of us, let me say this, can be shepherds too. It's not just the disciples or the apostles. Um, that Jesus is trying to show how to be shepherds, but each one of us should be involved in shepherding others. Um, it's, it's God's nature. It should also be ours. And so Jesus is saying, stop thinking about yourselves, and if you want to be great, stop thinking about yourself. If you want to be great, do what God does. And he seeks out the strain If you want to grow personally, then turn your attention off of yourself and on to someone else to help them grow. I think you'll find that's the fastest way for you to grow is when you are helping and discipling somebody else. There's the slide again. If we want to be great in the kingdom, we need to understand how valuable God's children are to him. And so do what he does. So let's continue reading uh, some more for instructions of Jesus about what is important to God. So verse 15 of 18, chapter 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Again, if I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So keep in mind that this passage is known as one of the uh, primary church discipline passages. So it instructs the believers and, and the church leaders how to deal with sin in the church and to do it in a fair and orderly manner um, all the way through the ultimate discipline of excommunication, of expelling someone from the fellowship of the church. But um, 
that is true, but let's not lose sight of the fact of what the real goal of this passage is about. It's about maintaining fellowship and relationships within the church. So it's about taking all measures to restore a person and avoid excommunication. So most of the time, perhaps 95, maybe 99% of the time, um, people, perhaps, yeah, 95% of the time, people, when they have hurt someone and are told about it, will repent and, uh, and agree that they did something wrong. And they will, love all the, they will love each other all the more, even if they had an embarrassing conversation. So um, Jesus is, the point of this whole passage is about how to maintain our relationships, not about how to excommunicate. So just like the strange sheep story, um, this is about how to restore a person to fellowship and to make sure their relationships stay fixed um, so they do not leave the church or that their relationships break down and the life of the church somehow becomes less satisfying uh, to people who are more difficult for, for those that are there. Um, we know what it, personally, we know what it feels like when someone does something to offend us, and, and we have this reluctance to, to talk to them, perhaps, or we keep a mental tally, even, uh, that kind of stays in our mind, and we're thinking, you know, when is this going to be dealt with? Um, but Jesus is telling them to deal with it right then. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said something similar to this. In Matthew 5, 23, he says, If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So God's concern is that we maintain our relationships so that we always want to go to church um, and see everyone and have a place of belonging. That's what this passage is mostly about. So sometimes um, we that are in church work will look at this passage in Matthew 18 as a way to protect, you know, protect the uh, purity of the church from sin. So theological discussions about this passage. And I have... I've thought this myself, and I suppose that it is true in some extent um, that we are protecting the church from sin. But I think that that kind of thinking can kind of also misconstrue this passage. Um, the passage is, is about people, not so much about the institution of the church. So we need to have the right balance here. So, for example, in some churches, they might want to call this room a sanctuary. I try not to use the word sanctuary. I might slip sometimes, but I think of this as an auditorium, okay? Because the word sanctuary um, means that it's, it's holy somehow, and that they might, churches might want to call it a sanctuary, and they want to restrict what happens in here just to be holy things. And um, so, but... This building is not holy. Um, it used to be a bank um, with full of all of people's worldly money. Um, but we found $20 in one of the tills when we, uh, when we bought the building. So, um, But what is holy here now is you. Um, you are holy to God, and he cares for you and your faith. And so there won't be any churches in heaven. Churches are not eternal. The only eternal thing is people. I mean, in, in God, of course, but we are what's eternal. We are what's holy, not the church or this place or anything like that. So re some religions also feel like it's their responsibility to... Uh, the, re the re responsibility of the followers to protect the honor of God. Um, and so they would seek to persecute the infidels, for example, or non-believers. They would even seek to kill or imprison those who might make light of their religion or their view of God. So I know of some Christians in one part of the world that were imprisoned for five years because 
they were merely praying against the holy book of this religion. So we do not have to protect God's holiness. We're not protecting God. He can take care of himself. So he has this entire world full of sin that is before his presence all the time. And he doesn't hide in a, hide in a church or a sanctuary uh, for protection against that. So oppositely, he came down from heaven to earth to befriend sinners and to get dirty and to bear this, their sin on the cross. So we don't need to protect God from sin. It's not our job. But so this passage about church discipline is mostly about how not to have church discipline. Okay, it's about how to meet personally with a brother or sister and turn them from their sin or offense so that their relationships can be unhindered. Um, that's what God's will is for each person, um, that despite their sins, they will experience forgiveness and have relationships in the church that are free and joyful with no trace of hindrance. So he wants all of his children to have a place of belonging. Um, slide again. That one. If we want to be great in the kingdom, we need to understand how valuable God's children are to him. And that their relationships with other believers are important too. So we're not talking about... Um, when we talk about this passage, we're not talking about having some sort of inquisition where we have to drag out of each other their secret sins. Um, we're all sinners. Um, but when we sin in such a way that people hear about something um, that someone did that it reflects badly on Christ or, or that if we do something or even don't do something that we should have done and that it hurts someone, um, then something needs to be said. So those are the kind of situations where it's something that's public or getting to be public um, within the church or when we actually harm someone. So I might recognize that I harm someone and approach them or someone else might feel like they, I harmed them. I might be unaware of it and they might come to me. Those are the situations that we're talking about. And that's what Jesus said. If your brother sins against you, go to him. So most people are not going to want to do any of this. Um, they, they might say, as is common in our culture, the first trace of a relationship snarl. They'll say, well, if that's the way they want to be, uh, to heck with them. Um, and many people at the first sign of trouble will leave the church and just go look, go to the next church. Um, or even drop out. But that option is not open to us. Um, if people do that, they are cowardly, and they're also disobeying God and his will for them. So he wants to take our relationships with our brothers and sisters so seriously that he does not want us to come to worship anywhere until we have dealt with it. And so he wants you to worship regularly every week he wants you to be here every week um, so go and deal with anything that keeps you from having a clear relationship with your brothers or sisters in Christ and so he's calling you to see the importance of your relationship as he does so for those of us that are courageous um, there are four steps that Jesus talks about here he says first Tell your brother or sister their fault or sin against you. If they repent of it, you have won your brother. And that's the goal. That's the desiring ending point. Um, it's personal. It's loving. It restores um, and it preserves a relationship. So conflicts and misunderstandings and even sin are inevitable. Um, but I can say to you that the people that I argue with the most are also my best friends. Um, I just ask my wife. Um, but those that, that, there are the, those people that don't let me get away with things, okay? And they're my best friends. So if that doesn't work, that first step of just talking personally to someone doesn't work, it says then go take one or two others. Uh, sometimes just having other people there 
would impress upon the magnitude of this offense. If it's just you and them, yeah, whatever. Um, but if there's other people now, it's like, okay, this is getting serious. And so others also can help clarify the importance of the offense and its implications. Just having others there, sometimes they might be able to explain better than you could why this is important. So hopefully it ends there, and the problem is dealt with, again, with understanding and compassion and, and forgiveness. Um, and like I say, for this, this first step and this step, relational problems hardly ever go beyond that. Okay, it would be, it would be rare if something like that went even to this third step. So step three says take it to the church. Um, this is something that has to be carefully considered how to bring it to the church. Now, we don't want everyone to know every detail uh, about whatever offense happened, but, but the basic nature of the issue would need to be explained. And this is uh, like bringing a problem to the family dinner table. Um, so when everybody is there. So the goal, again, is that through the pressure of the various relationships, that the person will repent and be restored. Um, again, for most people, this is way beyond what they signed up for um, in terms of coming to the church. So our modern way is to be independently, is to be independent and consequently, unfortunately, alone. If you want to be independent, great, you'll be alone too. Um, but for most people, they would rather be alone than have anyone mess with them um, or be involved in their business. So it's not a biblical value, and that's not how God sees it. If you are his child, you are part of the family, and families know things about you. comes along with it. So the final step is if a person does not repent with, with one person or two people or even in being brought to the whole church, they are to be put out of the church or excommunicated. Now, the word excommunicated is not in the Bible. It's just describing what happens. We break communication with the person. So Jesus says in verse 17, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer or collector. So the Apostle Paul, in uh, teaching the church at Corinth, um, about how to deal with sin in the church finally does come to the place where the purity of the church is to be considered. Um, and he tells them to remove the leaven um, from the bread, the dough. Now, we can't do that, obviously, but take the leaven out. It's, it's equated with sin. Take it out of the church. So this is a sin that is known and is notorious and it's bringing shame to the gospel. So in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, it says this. I said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters, since you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So that's why it's called excommunication. So this person has come to a place where they're not even listening to the church. Um, and they're being put out. And the Apostle Paul says not even to talk to such a one or excommunicate them. Well, is that cruel? Well, um, first of all, they're the one that says they don't want to hear what the church is saying. Okay, there's been three rounds. You're talking to them. Maybe a few people have talked to them. Another round that they're being brought to before the church, and they're not willing to listen. So they're not listening, so why talk to them? So the sin is to such an extent that there is nothing else left that you can talk about. It's the only topic that you have. And once you've said what you need to say, well, there's no more communication. But still, 
this practice, while it seems cruel, is for the purpose of restoring them. Um, they are meant to be so brokenhearted that they repent of their, their unrepentant, impenitent heart um, so that they return. So ultimately, um, the only grounds for a person being removed from the church is this impenitence. It's a, it's a lack of repentance. That's the only reason somebody gets excommunicated, at least biblically, because they won't repent. Um, and so there can be no sin that cannot be repented of. And uh, though there may be sins that need to be punished by civil authorities like murder or abuse or thefts of a certain level, um, but in terms of the church, the impenitence is what gets somebody excommunicated. So usually when uh, dealing with this, ex this issue of excommunication, we also talk about these verses in 2 Corinthians where the impenitent man from 1 Corinthians is readmitted back to the church because the excommunication had the desired effect, and that's repentance. So in 2 Corinthians um, Okay, I don't, doesn't look like the right reference, but it says this, for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough so that you should rather turn and forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. Um, so I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. This is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. And so this person was overwhelmed, or about to be overwhelmed with sorrow for being put out of the church. It, I don't know how many, how long this was, a matter of months perhaps, but they welcomed them back in. So these verses in Matthew are a clear call to think like Christ, to think like a Christian in terms of how we see our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, they are so important to God that Christ died for them. That means we cannot follow Christ if we don't know how important they are to God, our brothers and sisters. So that's why it's really not po possible to follow Christ apart from being in a church and knowing other Christians and interacting with them. So as they, as they say, you cannot love Christ and hate his bride. Um, you won't be good friends with a man and say, I don't like your wife. Um, and the bride, of course, is the church. Um, so God loves every believer so much that he sends his ministering angels to minister to them. And uh, we don't know how it happens, but we know it does. Uh, God so loves a strained believer that he seeks them out until he finds them. And this should encourage us anyone that has a, a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. Um, God also loves the fellowship of the church so much that he wants each of us to stand up and be courageous and talk to one another about our offenses to each other, um, whether they think it was they caused it or whether they think somebody else has something against us. So God wants all of these clouds of hurt feelings and these... Um, and desires for us to distance ourselves from each other, he wants those to be removed. And uh, he wants us to love each other as he has loved us. So we have to be careful in bringing up each other's sins, of course. Um, we need to be thinking, um, are they really sins? Um, or are they maybe just small offenses? Um, did, is the person giving me offense, or am I just taking it? Um, the Bible says in Proverbs 19, 11, it says, good sense makes one slow to anger. How many times I don't have good sense? Um, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. So most offenses are small, and we should generally overlook them. Um, we're not trying to pick out every little thing that, that comes out. So we should overlook offenses when we can. But when we can't, when it's still hanging in our mind and it's causing 
some relational tension, then we know that we need to talk to the person. So we also need to be aware that some sins are so serious that if they leak out into the church, that they can cause real damage. So we need to ask church leaders to be involved in such cases so that the needs of the church can be considered too. Um, the apostle words are a good encouragement uh, from Galatians 6. It says, brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So I think we can see God's, uh, Jesus' heart here. Um, and so next week, we're going to talk about the rest of Matthew chapter 18, and that's about forgiveness. And it's also part of Jesus' answer about how to be great in the kingdom of heaven. And so let's use the slide one more time. If we want to be great in the kingdom, we need to understand how valuable God's children are to him. I'll probably use that slide again next week. So we don't get to be transmogrified. Instead, we have to learn to love one another and forget about ourselves in the process. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word, how it shows of how important your children are to you. How much you love each one of us, how much you send your ministering angels to protect us, how much you want us to be saved from sin. Lord, thank you for coming to seek us and to save us, even as believers. Lord, you seek us out, and Lord, we are, we are grateful. Lord, you want us to have good relationships with one another, and there's not any hint of strain or a cloud in our relationships. So, Lord, thank you for your words. In Jesus' name, amen.
Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. You may be seated. So just a couple of quick announcements. Hiding His Word is on tomorrow night at 8 a.m. over Zoom for those that are participating with that. Pursuit Night is still going to be on break because Brian is still recovering, so he's, uh, you know, wanting to make sure to keep the students safe itself. So that's on break. But Morning Bible Study is still on for Thursday at 11 uh, over Zoom with Steve. And the other chosen groups, only one will be running this week because there's a couple of folks going up into the tundra to Toronto. So Emmy's group is off this Friday, but our group will be meeting on Thursday. We'll let you know uh, for those that are in the Thursday group if that's going to occur here at the church or not. Vic will give an update later on this week, depending on how Brian continues as well as his dad in terms of the recovery with COVID. Um, but last but not least, we do have our farewell potluck next uh, Sunday after church for uh, Brenda and John. So there's not a sign-up sheet in the back. We're all pretty good. We're all adults here. Uh, we can bring something, right? We can bring some good food. I'm looking back there. Okay, somebody got my, 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 got my line of sight. Okay, we can bring some good food uh, that we can share uh, in a good time of fellowship and to be able to give John and Brenda a beautiful uh, send-off as uh, that will be their last Sunday with us. I know a few folks won't be here in person uh, because they'll be traveling, but uh, make sure to uh, keep that in mind for next Sunday. Thank you. And now for the benediction. Please stand. This is God's blessing to you from his word. Listen to how much he loves you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Who wants to be great in the kingdom of heaven? He will exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Go and be blessed. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting.
is waiting 